All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out today, giving us your, what is it, Thursday afternoon window time. Um, I'm very excited to present to you on behalf of the Career Development Center and the Center for Music and Arts Entrepreneurship here at Loyola, the Arts and Entertainment Panel, Careers in Arts and Entertainment. So uh, please welcome our wonderful panelists and moderator. Um, I'll give you a little bit of information about them. Um, this lovely lady right here is Amanda Worslin. She's the Director of Education for the Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra. She's also a violin instructor here at Loyola, right? And she's in a band called Big History performing around town. So she does, <laughs> wears many hats. Um, she obtained her, or earned her Bachelor of Music Education here at Loyola, so she's actually a Loyola alum, same class as me, actually. Um, Go Wolfpack. Yeah. You're next. just adorable. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, next we have Marika Gabory. Gabory. Gabory, excuse me. And she's the managing director at Southern Rep Theater here in New Orleans. She obtained her BFA in theater from Southern, U Southern Oregon University. And um, I'll let everybody explain a little bit more about their career paths when, uh, when we do, when we, you all start speaking. Next we have Megan McLaughlin. She is um, a costume supervisor, and she's currently the costume supervisor on the major motion picture Contraband, which is starring Mark Wahlberg and Kate Beckinsale. She earned her undergraduate degree in technical theater with an emphasis on costume design from University of Southern Mississippi. So welcome, Megan. And um, on her way right now is Merritt Shallot. Uh, she'll be joining us as soon as she's able to. She is the Associate Director of Development and Marketing for the Contemporary Arts Center here in New Orleans. She earned her Bachelor of Science, uh, in, excuse me, Bachelor of Science in Earth Sciences from the University of New Orleans. And we're honored to have our wonderful moderator here, Professor Billy O'Connell. Many of you know him. He's a professor of music industry studies um, here at Loyola, teaches artist management, music marketing, and intro to music industry studies. Uh, he's been an artist manager for 22 years now, um, was also a label manager at Warner Brothers Records, and recently co-founded the nonprofit Cash Music Company. Cashmusic.org. Cashmusic.org in 2007, which provides a free open it provides, excuse me, free open source tools to help musicians foster communication with their audience and monetize and distribute their music. Um, another cool thing. That's, that's too much. To <laughs> well, I want them to know about you because you're going to be doing what the okay. question asking. Yes. Um, he recently released a new album by one of his management clients in the form of a printed book. So you'll have to explain more about that. Awesome. Pretty awesome innovation. So please welcome our panelists and moderator. Take it away, Billy. Thank you. So uh, the idea here is that um, we give you guys some kind of an overview as to what hope in Hades you have of uh, managing a career in, in the arts. And um, you have in front of you several people, including myself, who have managed to do so. And I hope to sort of, um, um, by giving you various perspectives, uh, you know, enlighten and uh, educate and maybe inspire you with some ideas and ways forward. So I'm going to kind of work through the panel. Um, with a series of questions that I hope are ones like the ones you may be stewing on right now. And uh, at the end, will we have time for Q&A? We'll do Q&A, so if you have questions that I don't address, please um, save them up and, and, uh, and fire them at us at the end, okay? So um, I'm gonna start with Megan. Um, each of you I'm going to ask you just to talk about your career path, how you got where you are, um, what it is you, um, what, you know, what, what led you, what stops did you make on the way to where you are now and, 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 and where are you now? Okay. <laughs> That's not hard. Um, I think I all, I, if anybody knows, you always have a kind of where you want to be. I mean, if, I always had a dream to work in the movies and the film industry, so my best path I actually started as a performance major at Auburn University in Alabama. And my first semester, uh, the costume designer came and gave uh, a speech and you know showed his renderings and stuff. And I just kind of fell in love with it more than I did performing. So 
I went that route and decided from then on that I was going to be uh, a costume major in theater because obviously they don't have it for film. And um, I think it was great, obviously, because you learn, you know, any path, you know, if you want to be a seamstress, they even, you know, if you get your own show to design your own show in, in um, college, you have to do a budget, you know, it, it, it gives you a little inclination of what, you know, it is like in the film business. Now, once you're thrown into the film business in my department, it's a whole new ball game. You only got like this much where you have to learn this much. Um, so I graduated in, in technical theater with an emphasis in costume design. And to get your foot in the door in the film business is very hard. It is very hard. Uh, I have family in the film business and that didn't even help me. So I'm going to guess that you can expect to work for nothing. For I a while. worked for nothing right out of college. I worked as an intern on three movies, 18 hours a day, and with no complaints. <laughs> Whatever they asked me to do, I was doing it. You know, um, but I think it's just a proof of loyalty. It's like the mafia. You know, yeah. once, yeah, you're you, made. once you yeah, prove you that made. you're okay yeah. to be there. You're golden for life. Come on, let me torture you some more for the next one. But I mean, that's just to get in. So, I mean, and throughout that, I mean, I've been doing this for 12 years. I started in college, actually. And I have done each and every step it takes to get to be a costume designer. And that is my best advice to you. It, regardless if you want to be in costumes, props, camera, wherever you want to be, you need to do every position to be a good boss. So you'd, be, you'd say you'd want to be open to inspiration. If you come across something in your studies the way you did, or you come across something in an internship and it really seems to light you up, don't be afraid to sort of pivot when you need to pivot and pursue the thing that you love doing. Absolutely. Um, and then be prepared to work for nothing for a while, which is, Absolutely. we talk about this all the time in music business and touring business people want to work festivals you know get used to pushing cases for nothing and, absolutely and and proving that you really want to be there exactly you got no choice you're a lifer not a hobbyist right right mm -hmm. um okay so um marika can you tell us a little bit about what led you to where you are now and, and a little bit about where you are now sure yeah um i uh i, I actually started i'm i'm now a theater administrator and a theater producer and primarily a developer of new work um, I started in theater uh, as an actress when I was a kid, as if you can call yourself an actress when you're a kid. <laughs> and uh, and I, I was, and then at some point I, I found myself working as a director more than I was acting. And uh, when I when I finished my BFA, which was had been both in performance and as a director, I uh, decided that I was sort of on the fence about what path to take into graduate school. So I decided to move to New York, uh, in part because I think in the moment that I decided to move to New York, I, I, I had this realization that if you said to people you were about to move to New York, they didn't ask you any other question. Like if you were going to move, if you were going to move to like Idaho, they would say, "What are you going to do in Idaho?" But if you said you were going to move to New York, that was like enough of an endeavor in itself, and it was just what you did. And I found out that I found out there was a reason for that when you got there, which is that living in New York is just hard in itself. Um, it's just it's just formidable, uh, just the cost and the and being there, particularly when you relocate, you know, across a country, uh, without necessarily the ties and the connections that you made on the other side of the country. So you kind of you kind of start over, you know. In in college in Oregon, I had you know gotten together with friends the way so many people do and started a little theater company to augment the work we did at school and. You know, somebody gave us a basement, and we were performing in basements and putting on, you know, plays at one in the morning when that's what fit in our schedule. And, and you know, we were wildly successful. And so clearly, I was going to go do that in New York. And and then I, I got there, and I was like, oh, it's it's so hard here. So you know, then you you start doing the thing. You know what they that say. People do. If, if you can make it there, though. <laughs> I'd like to sing a little song. Um, they, <laughs> there's, so. You then I think you do the, the same path where I uh, was also, I moved there as a nanny and I uh, took my first internship at $50 a week while I was booking escorts at night. And, uh, <laughs> and I, did, I did a lot of creative things 
to always be working in the arts. Um, and uh, sometime in my late 20s, I decided that I'd also like to have a child and that I was realistic about that requiring health insurance. Um, and at, at that point, I had done a lot of things to make my own work happen, from the basements in Oregon to getting together with people in New York and pushing work forward. And so I had sort of, you know, by default become a producer. And, and I found that the moving of work forward was, was something I was passionate about. And I was really lucky um, to start, uh, after a lot of other eclectic and different jobs uh, for different theaters, I, I uh, got connected with a, with a company called Labyrinth Theater Company, which is a, a, an off-Broadway company of, of note in, in part because of the um, sort of famous artistic directors who were, who were connected to it. And it was a really important uh, time for them in that it was a, a moment of big growth. At the time mm -hmm. I was hired, I was hired as like the other person where I didn't even have a job title for a little while until they figured out I would be the general manager. And at that point I was literally the other person because I was like the one other person who was paid on staff at that time. And we grew at that point from $400,000 to our largest at $2.2 million over the period of just a few years. And so it was, it was an exciting time to grow quickly to the head of that company where I was the producing director. And, uh, and then after 13 years in New York ended, I actually came here about a year ago to be the managing director of Southern Rep. And there's all sorts of reasons for that, but that's, that's how I got to here. So can I ask you, Labyrinth, at that point, you were earning your, you were earning your living at theater, or were you supplementing your... your I was, your yeah, I was earning my living. When, when I was hired at Labyrinth, I, I believe I was hired for $30,000 and no health insurance until I told them I had City. to have that part, yeah. you know, and yeah, in New York City. And before that, I worked for Samuel French Publishing some time before that right. for $19,000 right. a year, so, yeah. Wake up call, oh. right, at this point. So, um, first of all, I do want to acknowledge the fact that Merritt's here. Merritt, hi, I'm Billy O'Connell, nice to meet you. Hi. I teach here, I'm moderating. So, uh, so you've all been told a little something about Merritt by Georgia, you were introduced, but now you're here. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'll let um, Amanda talk a little bit about her career path, and then we'll go back to you, if that's all right. So, Amanda. Yes. What happened to make you uh, well, the, the LPL lady? Yeah, I am the LPL lady. Um, well, I, I'm originally from Atlanta. I came to Loyola University in New Orleans um, for music education. I was a music education major here. And I was astonished, actually, upon, I think it was in my second year, we start, you start going out into schools. And I was shocked that there was not as much music in the schools here as there was where I was from, Jonesboro, Georgia, you know, which is known for its rich music cultural heritage. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that kind of made me want to stick around. Oh, that um, Jonesboro. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Um, so, but then, of course, when Katrina hit, it was another, you know, I, I, I got to stick around this city and, and make, make this a little better, make this work. And um, because of my music education degree, it didn't work out so well to graduate with that education, that teaching degree in December because there's not a lot of schools looking for their teacher in the middle of the school year. So at the time, I was working after school at Lusher Charter School right over on Willow Street teaching uh, strings. I had uh, some private students. I was going all around. I had basically three kind of part-time jobs. And the LPO was looking for a person to go between to be their contact for the schools um, because they had materials they wanted to give. So they're still doing their concerts, but it was just it's a little haphazard as a lot of things were in 2006 here. Um, and so I came on board just working like nine to two, four days a week. And since then it has grown. I'm full time employed there. I'm in my fifth season with the symphony and now the education director. Um, I'm no longer teaching at Lesher because I could not keep it in my schedule, but I still teach here part-time um, in the Loyola University prep program. So, okay. yeah, awesome. it's kind of... Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. So you guys got that? You feel comfortable with everybody's career path so far? Merritt? Um, I've been with the Contemporary Arts Center for um, 18 years um, and started as a volunteer. I'm currently the associate director and oversee the fundraising development and marketing um, departments, which is really a very small department now, um, with the uh, recession and the BP oil spill effects, um, I think we're uh, all of us nonprofits are feeling it and probably will continue to feel the, the pinch for an, at least another year. 
But um, my start, I can top your stories. I think about how little I got paid when I first was at the CAC. I was hired um, on contract to produce uh, two of the fundraisers that the CAC does every year, Sweet Arts and uh, Art for Art's Sake. In those days, Art for Art's Sake was a street party and a big fundraiser that followed at the CAC. But um, since then, White Linen has, has flip-flopped that, so it, it's no longer a major fundraiser. Anyway, I, was, I volunteered. And then I was hired to produce those two events. And then I was hired to sell the building to corporate clients, rental, income, earned revenue. For, um, we ran bars. That's what we do really well. And I see a lot of familiar faces from the class. So <laughs> you know that peddling liquor seems to be um, one recession-proof industry somehow. <laughs> so we, um, we generate a lot of earned revenue through um, liquor sales, I'm, I'm afraid to say. But it also gives corporate people a, a big chance to get involved at the, um, at the um, sponsorship level. And of course, um, it, it just generates a lot of um, earned revenue for a nonprofit. <clears throat> so anyway, um, 18 years ago, I, I was paid 6000 a year. How's that? Did anybody actually pay to do their job? Anybody here actually pay money to do their job? Because that might be there. Might be there. <laughs> Maybe so. And, but, but to top that, um, things were so bad at the Contemporary Arts Center just after it was renovated. Um, you all are too young to remember those days, but it was an old warehouse um, in the Arts District. And uh, then in 1988 to 90, it was renovated uh, with $7 million and became the, the pretty um, space that it is now, but nobody knew what it took to um, keep it running. Nobody had budgeted air conditioning money. Now we had, you know, um, air conditioning and heating to worry about. We didn't know how to repair an elevator, you know, all, all kinds of unknowns. So the CAC went into serious debt. So um, I didn't actually get paid for two years. <laughs> then, then when I raised the money, I got to pay myself back. <laughs> so we're going to go down the panel and talk a little bit about uh, a typical day on the job. But just because I'm sitting here, I'll tell you a little bit about how my career path, because it, it's weird as well. I went to NYU. I graduated with a BFA in acting and film. I was a dual major. I, uh, of course, I, I moved to Los Angeles to, to try to be in, in uh, I, was asked, I, I was asked to come out to LA to audition for a, a network television show. I did and uh, uh, went right down to the wire, me and some old guy, it was gonna, they were either gonna go old or young, they went old. I had nothing to do, I was in Los Angeles, I'd been working in rock clubs in New York City and earning great money doing that because you make a lot in tips. So I thought I'd get my big idea, go to the rock club, get a job as a doorman again, make lots of tips, except nobody tips you in LA. So for two years, 365 days a year, a year for two solid years, holidays and everything, I worked a door at, a, at five bucks an hour, cash at the end of the night, just learning the music scene. And, if, and, and there's this idea that I wanna hit you guys with, which is the idea of you're putting in your 10,000 hours. You put in your 10,000 hours, you know, I, I, I'm Malcolm Gladwell's idea. You put in your time, you put in your service, you earn your spot at that point. And boy, I, that was my 10,000 hours. I got my first real music business job just because I had this voluminous knowledge of the music industry. I got hired by a TV show to, to basically cast bands. I was a talent coordinator uh, for an MTV music TV show. And from that, I made all these friends in the music business and I got a job at Warner Brothers Records when I was 22 years old. I worked at Warner's for, for four years. And then I started managing artists. So, you know, you got to put in your time. Um, I'd like to hear, I'm going to depart from the list of questions right now and ask you if you agree with the idea that it's going to be necessary for you to put in your 10,000 hours as an, as an individual in this room. It, you know, you need your knowledge, you need your background, you need your ability, but you got to, do you have to put in that time? You would, you would agree? Yeah, all of you? Absolutely. Mary, yeah. yeah. You, you see that? At least it, it opens You're going to have to bleed a little bit. Right? Yeah, you have, if you, if you want to be there when the opportunity arises for you to really make a career path out of, out of whatever you're doing, in the non, especially in the nonprofit sector, you just have to be there. And Megan, you know, in your case, you talked about it being like the mafia, right? You got to just put in the hours, <laughs> free hours, commit, make sure that you're supporting yourself. Whatever you have to do, that's not their business. You just got to prove that you can do the job. Yeah, I mean, I moved after 9 11. Uh, we filmed a movie here, and I saved enough mo money to put my clothes in a car and drive to LA. And I moved there for six years, but I'll tell you this. I slept in a sleeping bag for three months in an empty apartment, yeah. had no furniture, and I saved enough money after nine months of being there 
to buy some couches, and it was the best day of my life. <laughs> so, I mean, you really, and I feel like that's suffering because I grew up in a household where my parents supplied everything. So this was brand new to me to be able to support myself in a city that I was not from or knew very few people. So, I mean, I just think if you have it in your head that this is really what you want to do, you'll do anything to make it happen. Right. And if you don't, then you should decide then, maybe I should go somewhere else. Right. I mean, you know, a lot of times in art school they say, if you can do anything besides this and still be happy, do it. <laughs> do it. Because you have to be a lifer. You can't be a hobbyist. You have to be, you have to be in there and realizing that you have no choice but to do what you're doing. So you might as well, A, be serious and B, prepare to suffer. And you're gonna have to a little bit. Well, you also, Marie, Marie, you also yeah. I think, it's, I think it's, it's about putting in your time, it's about being in the right place, very much so. But I think it's also about that, <coughs> that's also where you learn. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have the idea that, you have brilliant ideas that are unlike anyone else's and you're very capable and, and you know, often I think school is like theater or music or art Disneyland, you know, because there's all of this resource and, you ha and what you have to put in is the hard work, but you're willing to do that, and you've seen it, and you've seen the results of it, and you've seen it blossom, and, and, you're all, and everyone is wonderful you know, in, their, in their private movie. But when you leave your private movie and you're in the world, it's, um, it, there suddenly is all of this new learning to do. There just is. And, yeah. I, and I think that the, that's during the hours is where at the door you, mm -hmm. you actually learned the information that you needed. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that you also... Um, you also I think you also create your home that way, um, maybe particularly for the artists among those groups. Mm -hmm. That that's where you, that's how you survive all of the shitty, crappy, bad parts. You know, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. now on film. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> that uh, that be, you're you a know. natural. <laughs> you know, that's where you. That's that's how you survive it. Is that you end up creating this kind of oasis, whether it's, you know, finding an internship that doesn't abuse you or finding some place that you can get by, you know, so I think you're, you're doing those things as well. You're creating a home and knowledge right. base. Right, so school's great. It's theory. It's, it's yeah. the opportunity to, to experiment in a safe way, in a safe environment, but at some point, theory meets practice. Right. You know, there's the saying in the military, no plan survives contact with the enemy. You know, instantly, as soon as chaos is introduced, you know, as soon as potential, uh, potential chaos, uh, the potential for chaos exists, you can't plan for the way things go. And, and that's, and that's, and so I, you know, I'd like to know, you know, uh, you know what, I, Amanda, you how do you feel about Yeah, that? you were talking about the 10,000 hours. I think for me, I mean, it was specifically learning about all these different string educator, all these string art players in the city. And so literally, I worked, I think, for every possible string teaching organization yeah. there is. I mean, obviously, the LPO works closely with Genoia, the Greater New Orleans Youth Orchestra. But I worked closely here at Loyola and also New Orleans String Project and for Louisiana Academy of Performing Arts. I mean, they're, they're just, it was yeah. really building all those relationships. And it took five years, but now I know where all those little people are. Right. And it helps me a lot with my job now to know where I can go to, where I can bring, when we have Yo-Yo Ma come in to perform with us, right. who can he go perform for, to make it a more valuable experience. It makes you more valuable. Well. Right, yeah. So. Um, okay, this is gonna be like, I'm gonna, we're, it's, it's so easy to get lost in this. Um, we have like a one minute answer from each of you. See if you can't give me 60 seconds, a typical day on the job, Merit. Well, today would be a good example already. I feel like I've put in nine hours. Um, so I got up this morning realizing that we had failed to submit a final report for a grant from 2008. So I scrambled to and, and actually submitted a final report in, within two hours this morning, um, and in addition to an update to another grant. Um, and I arranged for two really heavy duty meetings for tomorrow, that I, so tomorrow is all meeting day. Um, today we found out that one of our um, theater presenters um, has to cancel their weekend of shows, so we had a big PR push to try to handle how we're going to, uh, you know, deal with sold-out uh, shows tonight and all weekend long. So it's been um, an interesting half day. <laughs> so it's a lot of crisis, <laughs> crisis management and crisis. planning, right? right? So a lot of planning, yeah. 
obviously as a nonprofit, you have an awful lot of, you know, you have a long view into the future and you deal with that. So it's a lot of planning, a lot of... Lots of hats. I think that's common to the nonprofit right. sector. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, you, you don't, no real solid lines between the job descriptions. Right. Megan, typical day. I don't think there is a typical day on a movie set. I just, uh, you know, y you do what's required of you. Mm -hmm. I mean, my job is pretty much at the higher level. Right. So I'm not on set as much as I used to be. Right. But calls can be, I mean, calls can be anywhere from, uh, we are on military time, so this is going to sound funny, like 3.42 in the morning to you work till, you know. Um, military time. Yeah, you work till, you know, midnight or whatever. However long it takes to film that day's work. Right. right. It takes. But what's expected of you? I mean, are of you me? calling Yeah, I mean, are you uh, calling I, wardrobe people? Are you What are you doing? How, yeah, what, I what facilitate the needs of the set and right. my designer. Right. I schedule fittings. I Great. um make sure returns and purchases are organized on racks, alterations. Uh, it sounds very boring. No, a typical, vo a <laughs> typical voicemail message for you is, Megan, I need... Uh, it, it could be anything. Right. It's like a comedy show. Right. Anything. It's like anything. You know, right. I need an Indian suit. You know, right. yeah, it yeah, could yeah. be anything. I mean, today I had to... In a lot of with big studios, you have to get everything cleared down to a graphic of a bear. I mean, it's like ridiculous. And we're working with, you know, the Customs and Border Patrol people who we have a contract with, but they don't want their particular patches seen on camera. And you have to, you know, alter the patch. I mean, that's right, right, so right. Okay, but no, no, that's no, that, that I think what you're saying, like, but it's the headache, and you have to, you have to go. Okay, I have to please this person, and then I have to please my boss, and then I have to go to the monogram people and say, please, can I have this in about three hours? Oh, well, see, you that's know? great. Like, I mean, you're giving us a picture. That's though. how it is. It's and always like now, 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 now. Emails. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you have to answer emails. Yeah. The iPhone. Yeah. Yeah. That's what that's what nights are for. Exactly. Um, but but you know you're giving us an idea that yeah, many of us won't have. It's always organized chaos. Right. It is, right. and everything's thrown at you, and it, it's how well you handle it. Right. And how well you treat people. I would say that's the number one rule in any job: right. is be nice to every single person because you have no idea what that person's going to be doing in the next year. Right. I like that to teach person I could like, be your boss. I like to teach kids do everything you do with grace and with decency. Absolutely. And you get I mean that's just <laughs> the golden back. rule of life. Right. Because you'll get more you'll catch my mom used to say you catch more flies with honey or with, than vinegar. So, I mean it's worked out good for me. <laughs> Except sugar I'm up. Sugar I'm up. All right. That's fine. <laughs> there is one other thing that attracts flies. <laughs> yeah. well, we already said that. Marika, yeah. <laughs> Marika um, can you talk a little bit about a, a typical day for you? Because I, I know that, that Megan didn't realize, didn't necessarily value the, the little tiny insights into her day that she gave us in, in these throwaways, but a lot of us wouldn't have any idea what someone in her position is being asked to do. Right. So you know, let, let me know a little bit about that. Well, I think that particularly in maybe small uh, small institution, not-for-profit management right now where there's no money and many, many, many more hats than there ever were before, you get into the syndrome of there isn't a conversation or a meeting or an email that can happen without you in it because you manage every activity that happens. So it starts from deciding whether or not I can stay in the schoolyard with my daughter long enough to walk her to her classroom or whether I have to convince her that she can go off with her teacher and that I can run immediately to my car while I'm answering an email while my car is warming up so that I can drive to a meeting that got shifted earlier by a board person who's suddenly going to go get on an airplane even though they promised you that this was the day that they could meet with you. Um, and, you know, I, I do not advocate texting while driving, but I do do it at red lights because that's when, I, <laughs> that's when I'm actually communicating and catching up with... I, in, in an average day, I tend to send or respond to at least 300 to 600 emails in a day. So if you just, if you stop and then you have to catch those up the next day, it's why I always feel like vacation is half punishment. Um, and so in an average day, it could be finding out that you didn't get $55,000 that you thought you were going to get. Um, it could be finding out that you didn't get the rights to the play you thought you were going to get. These are examples of just the past yep. couple of days. Um, that uh, your and then your intern texts you. I'm I'm sorry um, for my tardiness, but I'm not going to come in today. And 
and this is the earliest I could have told you an hour after they were supposed to be there when you have a stack of things waiting for them. And, um, and they're free, so that's great, except that it's now a stack of things right, sitting there. At this point, you're just, you're, <laughs> you're just bumming things. us out. <laughs> <laughs> but those are the little examples. <laughs> we, we, yeah, but then we, you we see a wonderful piece of theater, and you're happy for the rest of your life. Right. right. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Amanda. Um, well, today I started my day. I was over at Bethune Elementary um, because we had a program this year sponsored by the Hearst Foundation. We were bringing ensembles out to 11 different schools in the community, and they had to do a pre-test before they saw these ensembles, before they came to our concerts, and then they did a post-test. So I was grading tests, actually, and <laughs> seeing if they knew which instrument the violin, what family it belonged to, and things like that. Um, we also, we, I was responding with, um, we got a, another grant today for one of our musicians to help teach strings in a school. Um, we're getting ready. We're doing a young people's concert down at Sacred Heart next week, so I'm putting seating charts together for that. Um, we're bringing more ensembles out next week. It's just going back and forth, talking to our 67 musicians, making sure that they are okay to talk with children and they know what to say to them, and, and they're really okay with that, and it's fine, and the kids love you, especially if you have an accent. Right. It's really cool. Um, you know, don't be afraid of them. They're yeah. just excited to meet you. Kind All of right, things. strange question. <laughs> For the three of you who are nonprofit people, how much of your day is percentage-wise devoted to fundraising, looking for money? It, I don't think it ever stops. Um, I, would, I would say, yeah, probably 60, 70 percent fundraising, okay. 40 percent, um, you know, administrative Marie duties. 80, 80 percent. Yeah. I mean, I'm in the education side. We do have a grant writer and development director, but... Um, Luxury. Yes, yes. Right. But, okay, um, so not, not much. Not, food. yeah. And, um, uh, Megan, you're just basically fundraising for yourself, so. That's, <laughs> that's cool. um, all right, so, you know, we're, we're, you know, a half hour has whizzed by. We have, we have like, roughly a half hour left. Um, you know, I want to talk a little bit about some of, you know, s s some more uh, that, that, may, that may really be relevant to these guys. So, could you tell me, uh, first of all, do you think it's necessary, one by one, I'll start with you, Amanda, do you think it's necessary to have had a particular degree to obtain the position you've obtained in your, in your particular field? And if so, you know, what degree is necessary? I think specifically for myself, absolutely, I needed my music education degree because a lot of the work that I do, for every education concert we have, I create a teacher guide that has all the GL, the grade level expectations that are assigned with every piece that we do because the teachers need to have this so that their superintendent can let them even come out to the concert because we are competing with the LEAP test, oh. which I'm sure maybe yeah. some of you have heard about <laughs> if you do those things. Um, so I think absolutely, yes, music education degree okay. was necessary for my position. Okay. Marika? Um, I think it's, uh, as in an arts administration, I think it's getting harder and harder to not have a master's degree. I, I do not have one and was able to um, make my way into a position that was a lot that most people would have had them in. Um, I had decided that at 30 I would reevaluate whether or not to do that and by then I realized I was in the position that I wanted to be in. Okay. You know, but, but I think that it's getting harder it, it, uh, and I think it gets you connections as well as a sort of a knowledge base to work from. It's, a, it's, it's certainly a head start to have the master's degree now. Right. Megan? I'm going to say to get your foot in the door, it'll definitely, on your resume, make somebody look at you, but in real life, no. Right. Um, yeah. I'm definitely the old school person here. Um, since I was a petroleum geologist and when the oil business <laughs> failed, that's when I became a volunteer and then an event planner. So, um, and sort of, uh, Obviously, my degree does has nothing to do with where I am now. Too bad oil never really came back. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Now it's just out in the Gulf. Um, the um, but but definitely the entry level positions in the um, in the development marketing side, um, all those people have graduate degrees in arts administration or in business, um, and that definitely gives you a, a little leg up on your um, starting salary. Okay. Great. If, um, in, in the spirit of kind of moving quickly through things here, sorry, um, I'm going to ask you if, um, if this is relevant to you, answer it. If it's not, just say, not really, my, not, really, uh, not really relevant to me. But how do you, in particular, deal with the instability of a career in the arts? Amanda? 
Um, is it relevant to you and your position? NEA is, is facing budget cuts, actually. To, I was just sending off those emails to our representatives this yeah, morning. Any, any mechanisms for sort of safeguarding yourself, keeping yourself, you know, keeping the odds higher for you? I mean, I, I, that's, I, that's why I still teach. It's why I still play wedding gigs. I see several of you that I've played gigs with, actually, this mm -hmm. past month. Um, that's why I'm playing music on the right. side, doing as many different things as right. I can. How about keeping yourself indispensable for the LPO? I mean, you know, trying I, to take on more. Anything education that comes through our door is, right. is me. I'm the only per and so I'm running around to schools. I'm putting together these concerts, right. helping writing the grants. I mean. Right. Okay. Great. Very good. Uh, I think on the on the on the on the way on the path on the way there that it's about finding the the things that make life livable. Um, that it means finding, like, because often it means finding a day job, it means finding a day job that imagining, like, what's the thing I could feel happy during, do, doing during the day so that if I have to do something else at night, I, I feel okay. I think it's sometimes about imagining how to make life feel sort of more content so you can do the thing that's hard. Uh, and in terms of the st instability of the industry, um, by being the person who always shows up on time and always does what you say you're going to do, you instantly rise above most other people, which it's amazing That's that it's just those point. two things. But those two dream. things are, it's, it's sort of amazingly it. It's amazing how few people show up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, showing up is eighty percent. They it, say it's, it, really it's, it might be more than it, that. I think it, yeah. it. I think it might be. It is amazing how many people don't show up. Yeah. it's appalling. Right, and so the person that's there is the person who gets the job. Yeah, if you, if you don't think there are ramifications from that, yeah. you know, no, there are fallout, that there's fallout from your actions, and that way you're 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 high. You're totally nuts. Yep. Megan, instability issue. At all? Uh, now, right now, no, because no, but how about on your New Orleans is booming. Right. Um, when I first started, absolutely. Right. I mean, what did you do to deal? Wait tables. Great. <laughs> the restaurant business? Food service is wait big tables. for anybody. I'm not, not a good waitress. Food service. <laughs> <laughs> food service is a smile and a wink. <laughs> no. No, food service is an amazing, is an amazing tool for a person to create. That's what you have to do. It's a dead end do. job. You can always get another one. <laughs> that, a dead end job is a, is a creative person's best weapon, right? You do a job, you don't care that much about it, it's not that inspirational, it's not that demanding, you go home, you got your money in your pocket, and you can leave it and get another one when you need to. Can we say attitude. a side note about that? Well, <laughs> um, just that I think that sometimes, maybe particularly for performers, that I think it can be tricky finding the jobs that are near to the thing you want to do, but not the thing you want to do. Mm -hmm. Because particularly when you then get a job in not-for-profit, um, it sucks every hour that you will give it. It's not the job that you can run away and go do the audition or the gig that comes up. Mm -hmm. And you think you're close to it, uh -huh. and I just think it's a really tricky thing to manage. Like, right. am I really, will you, will you spend seven years in that job that isn't quite what you meant to do uh -huh. and miss the other opportunities? And sometimes keeping, sometimes your criteria keeping it lower in that day job is, yeah. is more sensible. Well, that's why we all, I mean, I talk about this in my, in my management class. You're trying to evaluate someone's commitment. Are they in a, dead end job or are they working at a bank right. and enjoying the bennies <laughs> if I don't want them in a band that I'm managing if they're at the bank or if they carry a mortgage or I hate to say it if they have a wife and kids or a husband and kids I I don't want them in the band I, I need to not if they're work not if they're trying to make it happen if they're in a position where they have to bootstrap themselves it requires too much yep. you know I, I, I'm sorry it's just, it's just murder Merit, how about um, instability? Instability seems to be the name of the game. I've never been um, part of a stable organization <laughs> ever. Yeah. But um, as, as, as everyone is saying, it, it can create opportunity for somebody who is very committed. It, it builds in a little bit of um, job security if you are there to, um, to take, take the next challenge on. Great. Are there any, I think, I think people are probably gathering some of this at this point, but any strategic things that, that college kids now, kids in this room, could do to prepare themselves for the kinds of jobs that you do? Like, are there any essentials that they could do while in school that could better position them to do the kinds of things that you guys do? I, I, I'm gonna guess that volunteering, mm -hmm. doing something for nothing, putting themselves in the environment is the best, is the best way forward. I mean, how do you guys feel about that? Absolutely, I think with the, especially with the music, um, industry program here a lot of the students already ha have been doing you know managing festivals and and event work yeah. and that's that's how you launch your career right me oh yeah um interning 
It's just really hard to get an intern job on movies. I mean, it's, it's very rare that we are allowed to have them for insurance reasons because you're technically not a paid um, employee. So when we do get them, it is a, a delight, you know. Great. Okay. Great. I think it's. Um, I think I think it's two things. I think it's it's finding the right internship, and that it's um, always having some project of your own that's initiated by you happening at, at least once a semester. Yeah. So every every semester, finding some project that you initiate and move forward, um, whether it's something by yourself or with a group of friends. So volunteering coupled with some sort of entrepreneurship. With right. either so entrepreneurship kind of or, or I wrote a play, I'm going to do it, or yeah. I'm going to I'm going to um, create well, a short film in three days. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. That okay. you, yes, exactly. You're right. starting something yourself. Okay, great. I think it's about building yeah. those relationships with the people that you want to work for, right. work with. Right. Yeah. Starting to become known in the mm -hmm. field that you desire. Yeah. Right. That's that's great. Um, one of the questions here uh, is going to, is going to make you laugh. It is uh, give me the, uh, an idea of a reasonable starting salary in your field. We already answered this question, right? It's zero. It's zero for you. It's zero for you. Zero for you. Zero for you. Am I right? Am I right? I mean, you want to talk about starting salary? I think it might be more appropriate not starting salary, but like once you get all the BS out of the way and you're in a position, what kind of money can you earn? How about that? Twenty-five to thirty thousand as an entry-level position with benefits, which are worth another five or eight thousand these days. Right, Megan. Our position above intern is PA, production assistant. Right. And depending on what field, like our costume, uh, PA earns maybe $100 a day. Great. Um, but uh, 25000 to 35000 a year. Great. We were about twenty-five to thirty about with benefits. Yeah. Right. But ours is, I mean, ours is different in that, you know, it's for two or three months. Yeah, of course. It's, all, <laughs> it's in pe it's it peace changes. work. Right, of course. That's, that's really important to know. Um, so we talked about the idea of, of needing to supplement your earnings at this point. You know, you're, you're earning 25, 30 grand, and maybe you want a little something else. You know, it's hard to piece together several <coughs> jobs, you know, while you're making a living. How do you, tr how do you balance that? How do you how do you how do you balance the need to supplement your your income if you if you're in a position and and this of course is more relevant to people on the uh, on the ascent um, but how do you achieve balance and manage a lifestyle any any help well I'm married well so that helps <laughs> but um, but but on the others. Uh, I'm lucky. I'm very fortunate that my husband believed in the mission that I've been working for. So it was that's where he that's how he gives back is by supporting me. Um, but oh, I forgot what I was going to say. But um, the uh, what what was the second part? We were talking said? about uh, how to manage a life. You know, how oh, to, how what to I balance. See, what I, I see a, a trap that some uh, younger. Um, people who are trying to make, you know make a career but st still be an artist and they lose sight of their artist you know their craft and I, I think that's one of the biggest dangers um, that I see so let's 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 continue that because I think that's maybe the more relevant question how do you stay inspired you know art wise while st you know while still balancing a, a, a well, making I, a living I think what you said earlier uh, is that all, all I have to do to stay fresh and stay inspired, and I think it's true with all of our staff, whether they're you know in their 20s up to my age, um, is be involved with your actual programming. Don't don't you know distance yourself from what you're really there to do, which is the art, and that'll keep you going. Right. Megan, how about you? Uh, you know, I, I mean, it, we're more understanding. If you take an internship, I really can't give you any rules because I'm not paying you. So if you have a job to go to, absolutely. I'm going to work around your schedule because it is free help that I'm getting. Now, if you were to work as the production assistant, that's a little different. We're requiring you sign a contract that I have you for 12 hours out of the day. So that's pretty hard to keep another job. So you better really want to do what you want to do, you know, right. if you say yes to me. And then, and then, how about that idea of, of staying inspired? You know, staying about the art. How, do you feel do you feel like you have to do anything special to keep the fire burning? Well, I mean, I was a costume designer, so I do <laughs> renderings, and you know, um, I draw and paint. But you know, I, I honestly, um, it's very rare that I do get to do that. 
I mean, to be honest. If you're lucky. If I'm lucky. I did design my first movie this past year, so I did get to do it. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it's very rare, especially since most uh, movies are contemporary. Right. It's very rare that you'll get a period piece that you're like, ooh, I get to learn something new, you know? Yeah. Because yeah. there's a lot to learn on right. a period piece. Right. Great. I used to uh, teach a class in producing as part of this master class series in New York and one of the assignments would be 16 people would get together who had just met each other for the first time and they would be given an assignment at the end of our first session um, to that they were now a theater company and that when I met with them seven days later in that seven days they would be required to have created a, a new piece of work that didn't exist before that was at least 20 minutes long was seen at least by 25 people and had some proof of having been you know taken place. Uh, and and uh, and over the years of teaching that, that that class multiple to you know to 15 times in a year, nobody ever failed at it. They always did it. And and sometimes they spent some stupid amount of money, but usually not. Usually it was like 10 bucks, you know. And they found that among the 16 of them, that there was a lot of resources that it, that that existed. And so and that and part of that master class series was about how to stay feeling like an artist in New York. Was all about how to how to get work done. And that's why the the answer before was always be doing your own project that's because that's going to be the answer to how to how to feel like an artist that's is to always be moving work ahead that's great I, I think some days uh, inspiration comes easier than others some days you know we have a, an amazing guest artist coming and just sitting and listening to him play this cello concerto is makes me oh, you know I'm so happy that I'm doing what I'm doing or sometimes I get little kid letters coming all the time from our concerts that are saying the violin is my favorite instrument, and I can't wait, and I'm so glad, and I love the LPO, and it's just it's so, like, oh gosh, I have the best job ever, and this is great. But it's, it's, it also can be hard sometimes. I mean, I'm a violinist myself, and then here I am driving around these violinists, and they I'm, they look at me as I'm the driver. Right. Yeah. And I, I sometimes... I don't know. That's that's why I play music on the side. That's right. why I go. I I joined a band, and I just right. I gotta get that creative side out. That's great. To, yep. to do that. How about uh, how about this? I mean, do each of you guys find uh, feel that um, as as many people or as many parents might think, it's less practical to pursue a a, a, a career path in the arts than in another business. Do you? Can any you know can can either can can all of you at some point comment on how you feel about the idea of of a career in the arts as a practical as a practical contribution? I think I did the most practical of the arts. Right. I tied it with education, so right, there's right. always hopefully they will always hire educators to keep the arts alive in our communities, and right. so that's that's I I feel the most practical way you can do it. I don't know. Right. Do you, do you feel like you, you're just, it's okay, it's impractical and that's cool? Or do you feel like, no, it's quite practical to do what we well, do? Well, I think it depends. You know, my, when my now six-year-old wish said to me at, at four or five, she asked me when she was going to be in a play without thinking. I said, why would you want to do that? And, <laughs> and, and, and then I went, oh, I mean. No, uh, dirty. <laughs> I thought you said you wanted to be a teacher. Um, but, but so I don't think it's ever going to be practical to be an artist. Um, I think that it can be more practical to be in administration, but you know every moment you read about cuts, so it's it's it, the more practical it gets more practical, the more it becomes about skills mm -hmm. and less about discernible talent and whatever else that's about. So it's, I, but I no, I don't I don't think being an artist is ever going to be a practical. Right. Person. So you're okay with it being impractical. You have to you have to be okay with it. It has to be about passion, not about practicality. That's that's just the way that is. Right. Right. And I think I, I think you know, Megan, do you agree with the idea that you know, there you have to measure something else. I don't think anybody should tell you anything. If, it, if it's your dream to do this, do it. I had my father.